really exciting to be here with Peter, who, as you heard, if you didn't know Peter's background, I mean, this is, this is a gentleman who's been uh, a pioneer in an industry that, you know, pioneering uh, 10 years ago, or even in 2014, uh, was a lot more difficult than it is today. We, we had a chance to catch up in the green room, and, and one of the topics just was change in perception and, and how that's you know, really, really changed the, the, the playing field. But before we get into that, I, I, I actually think it'd be very helpful, Peter, for the audience to hear a little bit about kind of how you started out 10 years ago. Because then I want to talk about, I mean, Metrum was one of the first real big transactions in the industry that inspired so many um, other operators to not only seek out major partners, but, but get going. So I want to hear about that. Um, and then I really, you know, we're here to talk about slang because it's been an exciting six months for your company. Um, so start us just a little bit in the beginning on how you got here. Yeah, so 10 years ago, cannabis was still this super illegal product almost everywhere. Uh, you know, probably similar use to today, but it was highly stigmatized and obviously there wasn't an industry. Um, Canada had this grow for yourself model that uh, was the result of a series of lawsuits where people basically said, um, if Canadians have a human right to medicine and cannabis is medicine, then it's a human right that we should be able to access cannabis. And that was a successful argument, which led to the government trying to figure out how people would access cannabis. Uh, there was an RFP, a company uh, that became Canamed won that RFP, uh, which is now Aurora. Um, but ultimately it was new. They weren't producing cannabis very successfully. So uh, there was another lawsuit and the patient said, we should be able to grow for ourselves because not only can we not afford this, but it's no good. And that was successful. Um, so then there was this proliferation of quasi, well, illegal if you were selling to anyone other than the three designated people you were allowed to grow for. And that created this highly distributed gray slash black market in Canada. Um, so that you know, fast forward to um, uh, 2010, 2011, the government's trying to figure out how this should all be handled. And we had a, quite a conservative leader in power who wanted to just get rid of it. And the idea, to, his idea for getting rid of it was to commercially license a small number of producers that could be tightly uh, regulated, carefully overseen. And that was uh, what was going to get rid of the riffraff in his view. Um, and so I was in tech, and my uh, co-founder, Billy Levy, also was in tech. And um, we saw this is just a really interesting cultural moment, entrepreneurial opportunity. And what the government really liked about us when we started talking to them was that we knew nothing about cannabis, and we had no experience with cannabis. And in their view, if our business failed, we'd go back to tech, and we wouldn't you know, have the connections to put it in the streets. Is um, that critical for... Uh, anybody coming into the industry at that time? Was that, was that the blueprint for, um, I've never done this before, and actually I'm... Um, Largely I'm speaking, novice. yes. There was a little lip service paid to a few people that were like the absolute most uh, you know, proper participants of the old systems. There were a couple people, but really it was lawyers and um, you know, uh, bankers and tech people, people that had no experience, which was somewhat counterintuitive, but hugely beneficial to us. So we uh, applied, uh, successfully won a license in those early days, um, and that allowed us to draw early capital. We found another group that was also early licensed and, and merged entities and, and formed a company called Metrum Health Corp uh, five years ago, uh, almost today. Um, and, and time flies incredibly quickly. A few months after that, um, Fidelity led a financing to go public. It was the second company to go public. Um, in the space to Tweed before it was called Canopy Growth. What was Fidelity thinking? I mean, seriously, they, they had a lot on the line for you know, reputational issues. When I think of Fidelity, um, I, I think of one of the more conservative financial institutions in the world. This doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and I think we might have been their first and last check <laughs> to the space, um, mostly because it was, a, it was an underperforming investment for a couple of years. But I think uh, what they saw was that our team was a bunch of uh, bankers, lawyers, and tech entrepreneurs. Our, our chairman was the former CEO of TD Dominion Securities. Another one of our board members was the commissioner of the RCMP. So that would be like the head of the FBI here. Wow. And he just left his position as the head of Interpol. So we had like the super cop, the banker, a bunch of tech kids who wouldn't hurt a fly. And, uh, and then we had a, an auditor on our board. And it just read like the um, exact opposite of, of who you'd pull at a central casting for a weed business. 
Um, so, and that was like a lot of the folks, um, Bruce and, and Mark and the folks at Canopy, yeah, talk, similar talk profile. About, so, so talk about how Canopy um, becomes essentially a, a partner and, and ultimately, uh, you know, your, uh, uh, your sugar daddy. But, but, it, but again, it's, it's a yeah. small community. It's, it's uh, certainly back then it was even smaller. So um, how, how did they view you and, and ultimately um, for people that don't know the transaction, what was the strategic element of this for them? Yeah, so this, uh, so by 2015, uh, Justin Trudeau became Prime Minister of Canada at the very end, and that was really. And by the way, Bruce is Bruce Linton, CEO of Canopy Growth. I don't mean to be pedantic, but you know, he he is kind of like Bono or Madonna or you know yeah. someone who who Sting. They kind of go with. He'll go down in history when yeah. they're writing the book on legalization. It'll he'll be kind of like uh, the less controversial Joseph Joseph Kennedy you know, senior right. kind of guy right. um, who really was there at the beginning and, 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 and jumped on the commercial opportunity post-prohibition. But uh, once Justin Trudeau won, there was this sense that legalization may actually take place. We went from trading 1,000 shares a day at $1.50 and no one caring to all of a sudden a bunch of volume. The stock went for a run. Um, and uh, the first kind of wave of M&A started taking place. Um, it was a small world. It still is a small world. Uh, generally, but in cannabis, it's extremely small. So I think we've been good about not trashing anybody because uh, you never know who you're going to wind up being partnered with, bought by. Hiring. How would you trash them? It happens, you know. It's uh, it's. Uh, you know, what's interesting is because, uh, and not to get lost on this, but it, it, you know, in, in some sense, um, some of the Canadian LPs that have been the most successful have been the biggest targets, um, just because their market cap has exceeded necessarily what people perceive to be, you know, a valuation that makes sense. But you know, some of some of the biggest players in Canada. Um, you know, in some sense, they, they take a lot of heat for having been pioneers and being very successful in capital markets, even when their businesses haven't been as mature. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky situation. And since Canada is a federally legal environment, um, it was able to attract certain capital that didn't have to be worried about the whole state federal issue. Um, so Canada kind of punched above its weight capital markets wise, because there was a time. So going back to our transaction, we, we competed, you know, we were, we were fierce but respectful competitors. And as we were looking at, you know, at the space, ultimately a conversation led to this is a powerful combination. So we had a similar number of shares outstanding and the transaction was like 0.8 to one share ratio. So it almost cut canopy in half, um, all stock. People said we were crazy. People said they were crazy for paying 430 million. But anyone who held on, that would be like a couple billion more, yep. more than a few billion today, because yep. that was at like a, you know, that was a eight dollar a share. Yeah. Ish. So, so where were you um, after this transaction? Because again, you, you know, you had you had built your company, um, and yet you know one of the great companies in cannabis history takes you out. Um, uh, your you know, what, what was either your role in the new entity or how did you take uh, what had obviously been a, an enormous success? And, and really, how do we get to slang, which, which, you know, ultimately is also, you know, the combination of bringing a couple assets together, which we'll talk about. Yeah, so the early days of the, uh, of, of Metrum Health was kind of like my boot camp operationally yeah. in the space. Um, and that took us to the U.S. quite a bit for just kind of recon. Visiting Colorado, especially in the early days, you got a sense that uh, Canada, while it was ahead on legalization and the capital markets, had a lot to learn operationally Operations. and, and brand-wise. Yeah. So we saw products go from, you know, an unbranded jar of cannabis with a little label maker saying Super Lemon Haze, to vaporizers, to edibles, to more sophisticated things. So we already knew that that was coming. Um, so the interest for me was to be part of that. So after the uh, canopy transaction. Um, you know, on, on a very friendly basis, um, Billy and I decided to focus our efforts on the U.S., making uh, investments personally, mm -hmm. continuing to foster relationships that we'd, we'd formed years earlier, and, uh, and put all of our weight behind the next wave, which we saw as consumer packaged goods. Uh, we got our 10,000 hours kind of in that limited license, vertically integrated environment, which was great, but really hard to scale. And it's really hard to be a great farmer, a great processor, a great you know, formulator of finished goods, great marketer, great retailer. Right. Um, usually people consolidate to that later, and sometimes they, they break stuff off, um, as we've seen uh, in other industries. So our view is this is going CPG. We want to be part of it. That was an early idea two and change years ago, um, but, but we jumped on that. Um, and Canopy liked the concept, but they couldn't put equity into the business. Uh, so we created a unique structure that allowed them to have a warrant to buy equity 
if the federal law Change. allowed them to do so. Sounds like was, something we've heard of recently. Uh, yeah, which was effectively the template for, uh, for what happened with uh, acreage. With acreage. Yeah. Um, and other LPs have quietly done similar things, or they've spun out assets with convertible warrant kind of structures. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was early. Um, you know, we we're proud to be part of that. Um, and ultimately, the, the following two years led to putting together the assets, the people that were kind of the best of, of the things we saw and the people we knew. Um, so you know, Slang went public uh, this January, and we were incredibly lucky that uh, you know, we were one of the few deals that went way above and stayed above issue, you know, decent volume. Um, the trends have kind of come in our direction. So yeah. It's not like any genius on our part. It's just the timing's worked really well. Well, I mean, it's been a time when there's been enormous. Uh, can you hear back there? I'm seeing a. You can't. You can't hear Peter. I think I just will hold this thing. Okay. Can you hear me? Unless you can okay. turn this up quite a bit. That's, my wife calls me Boomer. So, <laughs> um, so this is happening at a time when, obviously, if you think about the fourth quarter of 2018, you had all the major U.S. multi-states coming to market. Um, they were RTOing, by the way. You decided to IPO. I mean, talk about that. Uh, yeah, so most people did an RTO uh, in Canada um, where they backed into a shell or, or a CPC. We did a full prospectus, right. um, and that, I think, inspired a lot of confidence uh, in sort of the more institutional investment world. And when we were raising money, um, especially in New York, there was a certain uh, reticence to be part of like a traditional Canadian cannabis RTO. And people were really appreciative of the fact we did a prospectus, which was a little more work at the beginning, a lot more disclosure, um, but cleaner. And, and I think was part of why it was a successful. Yeah, business. I mean, if you think about that, I mean, every, almost every one of those multi-state operators that, that RTO'd in the fall, um, not only was there a market decline that was a exogenous factor to cannabis, which certainly impacted cannabis, but, but it, it, it clearly was a case where the RTO was becoming a bit of a, of a stigma. Yeah, there were a few black eyes that the Canadian markets got from from different reports of transactions that went down or a couple of years earlier. Um, and just less transparency makes people less comfortable. Yeah. So I, I think that, that uh, you know, there were a lot of issues in the fall. There were macro things that affected those folks beyond their control. Um, we waited that out. Um, and, uh, you know, I think over the long, long term, none of that will matter too much because the people putting a fundamentally good, you know, business together will be successful. But it doesn't change the fact that on the days the stock is up, I get no calls. And the days the stock goes down, I get a thousand calls. And so I'd rather have more days when it's up and down well, uh, and operationally. All I can tell you is, you know, the S&P is <laughs> down 130 basis points right now. So I'm sure cannabis is down four. Yeah, um, and, and eventually and, uh, I think you'll see maybe things go the other way because, um, you know, in CPG where we believe this all goes, uh, Hagen dawes will, will do quite well relative to the lower quality ice cream because it's one of the last micro luxuries you get. If times are tough, a $10 pint makes you feel pretty good for the, you know, little bit of time that you're eating it in front of Netflix. Um, Indeed. So I think, I think cannabis isn't going to be bulletproof in a recession and certainly the capital markets and the fundamental business will, you know, obviously move in sometimes different directions. The long term, they'll catch up to one another. But I do think that we are all lucky to be either investors or participants or thinking about either one of those things in an industry that does have so many macro tailwinds yeah. globally. I think, you know, and we'll, I think I, I, I want to get to the capital markets world um, because I think there's no question that a big part of the, the evolution of the industry has been the capital markets dynamics for better or worse. So let, let's get to that. And I, you know, ultimately I want to get down to the essence of, of slang um, and how you view yourself. And, and in a world where you've, you've created uh, companies, you've, you've certainly, certainly um, focused on consumer products, but um, you know, you've been referred to as the conglomerate of weed or a portfolio of brands. Um, how do you think of yourself or, or you know, for a company that really um, you know, has some brands that you brought together right away, um, and maybe you start with the genesis of essentially the Organa acquisition uh, and Firefly and bringing together well-known brands um, and saying that we want to add our own expertise to and, and take it to the next level. Yeah, so we, we do have a portfolio of brands. As a collection, they've done you know, almost a few hundred million dollars worth of sales at the cash register. They differentiate cash register um, because ultimately that's where you can tell how consumers are voting with their dollars and that's how you know where you stand. Um, how we break out geographically, well, we do have uh, one product or another on the THC side in 12 states and our hardware in all the states and a uh, handful of countries. 
we do uh, generate more of our business sort of west of the Mississippi where it's, it is more competitive, um, you know, with Colorado and California being the biggest contributors, but also the biggest contributors just tracking the biggest markets uh, for cannabis. So as a consumer packaged goods company, we've organized ourselves as such. We don't uh, own any cultivation. Um, we, cu we buy biomass. We process it into finished goods, you know, under our brands and our formulations. And we don't own any retail either, not because we think it's a bad business, but... Um, yes, and you're, you're, some of your partners, you're, you know... You're, you're yeah, but retailers are our partners, so we'd be competing. So what you see typically, you know, in, 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 in the grocery business or, you know, most retail is that chain stores aren't carrying other chain stores, private label brands. Like your house brands aren't going to be carried by your competition. Um, and so by not owning retail, we're in almost a few thousand retail environments, um, and the success of those retailers is our success and vice versa. Um, so we're not cultivators, we're not retailers, we're really focused on uh, procuring biomass, making our finished goods, and then wholesaling it um, and distributing it to, to end retailers. And that's a model that we're able to um, operate under because most of our business is in those more mature markets. In a limited license, early stage market, you just can't do that um, because they require vertical integration because that's easier to regulate. You know, going back to Canada, it was a lot easier to say, okay, you got five people are licensed and you each do everything from seed to sale. So I can send three government officials to your facility every month, which was insane, but that's what they did. And we can go through everything much more easily than if there were a thousand of you. But once the stigma co goes away, people realize the sky isn't falling, the data comes in, you know, car accidents are flat, opiate deaths are down. Most importantly, tax revenue is up. And they say, oh man, how do we get more tax revenue? Well, the way you get more tax revenue is license more people, break up the verticals, and generally create a, a, a bigger industry. And that becomes the, the, the phase where our business model really excels. But even in those limited markets, which you can't ignore because they're incredibly exciting, like Illinois is going to be hugely exciting with the, the new regulation that was announced, um, we, we look for partnership. So we're not elbows out. We don't think that we're the smartest and we're the only ones that are going to be able to pull this off. We look for good partners. And a good example of that is in Florida, where we said this is too exciting of a market to ignore. Um, Florida, on top of the fact that it is a large population, the data is showing us they're big cannabis consumers. And uh, that's a limited license, vertically integrated environment. So we had a lot of conversations and ultimately um, the largest uh, retailer selling the most cannabis in the state was the company we ultimately decided to work with. They're called True Leave. And um, the way we looked at the Florida market was we could either uh, buy in or earn in. Buying in is obvious. You buy a, a license or you buy a company that has a license. And we saw earning in as, as saying, hey, you know, company X, our brands, we can demonstrate, we'll bring people off the street into your stores versus the other stores. You can look at, you know, Harvard Business. How, how, do, you, how do you decide on a true lead? What, what was it? I mean, you know, clearly they are market leader, right? There's, there, there are one or two in every segment. But, but as you assess, again, a, an earn-in, um, it's critical that you choose the right partner. So um, what was it about True Leaf um, as opposed to, I don't know, Vitacan or somebody else in Florida? What did yeah, you see? I mean, to put it really simply, True Leaf sells the most weed. Um, that's, do that it. makes them by far the most appealing person to us because uh, that's our goal as well. And, and also, Kim Rivers, the CEO, is an incredibly yep. smart person yep. and really good operator. Um, and just runs that operation so, so incredibly well. At, at this point, um, because of the nature of the operators, I mean, do you, do you have kind of a wish list of where else you guys think you want to be finding these partners? And again, partner in the truest sense of the word. Um, you know, Kim is somebody that, that, that stands out for people that know truly. I mean, it's a, it's a very well-run company. Um, it's a company that's been generating higher margins, um, got out of the gates early. So. Tell me how you assess partnerships um, in, in the places you are not yet. What, what are you looking for? Yeah, so on top of the, you know, the, the metric I just gave, you also have to look for people that are um, practical and thinking further into the future about how we can help each other. We were talking in, in the green room with, with a, the CEO of a multi-state operator about how it is a big pie and there are going to be um, a lot of opportunities to win, and there's no business model that I can say definitively is the business model for the short to midterm. You know, we can see in the distance how this probably breaks down, and we can apply 
margins and you know basic metrics from other industry to cannabis. But what it, at what point is that going to be the case? Um, so we look for people that are practical in terms of the wish list. You know, this is obviously one of the places that'll be really exciting. Um, the whole, yeah, Bravo, <laughs> Illinois. Illinois is going Absolutely. to be a great market. But again, it already is if you're in the black market. Yep. Uh, so you can kind of look at human behavior. It tracks pretty consistently in the kind of the Western world, even though s reported cannabis use isn't always as honest like Vermont to, you know, Alabama. But I bet if you test the sewers of all of these cities, the THC content in the aggregate urine per capita is super similar. <laughs> I don't want to be doing that. <laughs> I'm um, sure you have analysts for that. <laughs> you, you've gone out of your way to talk about slang as being a, a CPG story. Um, and, and I'm sure everybody who's in this room has heard cannabis industry being described as, you know, it's about brands, brands matter. Um, good, because that's a second derivative conversation that I think we were not having even 12 months ago. People understand um, pricing power comes with brands, sophistication comes with brands, that truly that's how you stand out. But, I want third derivative. Um, so, Peter, how, how, how do you how do you compete where everyone who I talk to says we're building the brand? Um, how are you endeavoring to stand out from the crowd? I mean, it just so happens you've got some you know some some core hardware and and house brands that I think have become staples of the industry, and therefore they're out there. Um, but but. I hear everybody talking about brands all the time, and that's great because that's what it's about, but I wanna hear how you're gonna compete with all the other guys that are saying it's about brands. Yeah, so I think there's gonna be like a certain special sauce, but a lot of it is just the, the textbook CPG playbook. Um, our, our, the head of our sales organization came from Konica Minolta, where he was sort of selling the most boring product in the world, the office printer and photocopier. Now in cannabis, he's like been unleashed. Uh, to sell something that people actually want, but he still applies the same uh, sales methodologies. He's organized a sales team in a similar way. And I think you're going to see better and better bench strength coming from the mainstream into cannabis as the stigma comes down. But the brand also has to uh, stand for something and be associated with something. You know, if you think about the original brand as like the hot iron you'd poke your livestock with, it was just to, to say, this is my livestock, this is my product. There's a lot of people with brand, but nothing to poke it with. Yeah. You know, um, and so our brands have been in market for a long time. So um, part of it, uh, another thing our, our head of sales likes to say is the best ability is availability. So if your brand is in a lot of places, that's how you create subconscious relationships with people. I've seen that before. I've seen it in all these places. I'm kind of trusting it a bit more. Um, they develop then a, a relationship of purchasing it and they form habits and then they, you know, uh, the first few trips into a dispensary starts very conversational. You might be in there for 15 minutes talking to a bud tender, but by the hundredth time, you kind of know what you want. Everyone's busy. Uh, they just want to come and go. Um, so I think just availability is super important. But then brands typically, you know, do have to stand for something or be associated with something. Um, you know, Nike isn't just the swoosh. That's how you tell a Nike. But they did kind of reinvent the sneaker in the 70s. Innovation, um, yeah. they, and I had know. those Air Jordans that you could pump up the back, and they still <laughs> had me jump about an inch off the ground. But nonetheless, yeah. And um, Hermes is, you know, coming off of 200 years of craftsmanship. It's not just an orange bag. Uh, so our. So what is your ethos? Yeah, so what, our, what do people know about slime? So our our 510 thread to be technical, but our uh, cannabis vape. Um, is one Explain of the Explain the 510 thread for the 510 that is just a, a literal linkage a here. diameter in millimeters of the threads that you, you know, spin the cartridge onto the battery. But it's the generic, it's like the USB uh, standard kind of thing for vaporizers. So lots of people have it. It's almost an agreed upon uh, form factor. We were the first uh, in market with one of those a lot of years ago. It's become very competitive, but you know, it. Our brand is based on both innovating in that space and then competing successfully in that space. In March, we still had the number one selling uh, 510 thread vape in Colorado after facing over 150 competitors that have come and gone over the past sort of seven years on that product. Um, and then, you know, on the Firefly side of things, we, we just are launching a new dry herb vape. Um, but we were one of the first with a uh, convection dry herb vaporizer, which I can get into a lot of technical mumbo jumbo, but basically it just allows you to capture a lot more of the flavors, a lot more of the cannabinoids. It's more of a connoisseur product, which again, 
prices it higher than most people are interested in paying, but it's based on innovating in that space and it authentically delivers value to someone in the market that wants that. So we have products that have history. We have products that are differentiated. Um, Deborah has a report on uh, sort of the vape space, which you can look at. That's and a fascinating report, by the way, which you know, uh, if you didn't know what 510 was before, you're gonna know what 511, 512, <laughs> but the bottom line is, it's, it's become, first of all, I mean, it's a very competitive segment, though. So, you know, you're competing with not only PAX, but you're competing with the entire continent of China. You're competing with, you know, I see deal flow all the time, and half of them seem to have uh, a, a vape element to what they're doing. So. Yeah, so, I mean, on the supply chain, we leverage China. So we're not saying that we invent, like, the 510 cartridge that it actually goes into, that's a piece of hardware we'll buy from a third party. What's inside it matters. You know, if we all agree that this is the size of a beer can, um, you're no longer competing on who has the cheapest, best can. It's more about like what's in the can and, and how you describe the relationship people have with what's in the can. So that's how I see the 510 thread side of things going. And then with PAX and the proprietary battery and cartridge model, there's a bit more of a technology angle there. But we're starting to see even with, even with the proprietary stuff, PAX and everybody else, um, the sales are, are basically equal to the high-end formulations of the 510 category. So it's going to be very competitive, but what we like and, you know, uh, about our model is that we've been competing. Like, if you go, again, to Colorado, Oregon, California, Washington, all these places, it's highly competitive. So when we're looking at um, acquisitions, we really like management teams that have succeeded in those markets because they're like, um, you know, athletes that have traded at, trained at altitude. You bring them down to sea level and they have that extra edge because they've been just duking it out. Um, not to say that people... So a vape, you know, or, you know, or a cartridge that's, that's been particularly successful in California, which is the most uh, competitive market, it's the largest market in the world, that's the guy you want. Yeah, from a management standpoint. And I think we're all witnessing a shift in brand trends from the sort of giant monolithic top-down brands like Kraft and whatnot to the more regional plays, just generally speaking, and it'll happen with cannabis too. So there's a certain regionality that people are drawn to. And so, you know, even if you have a 510 thread vape in Colorado that's really popular, it doesn't mean it's automatically going to be welcomed uh, by the Washington market or the Oregon market, especially the Oregon market, who really does care about the local, you know, craft story um, at a good price. Um, so that's why, you know, we'll, in our portfolio, we'll have products that technically have similar characteristics in, in Colorado and Washington, but they address totally different markets, and we don't see them as overlap, um, and, and they're both so doing incredibly you're, well. And you're talking about, not only are we talking about geographic, but we're certainly talking about consumer demographic targets too, right? So exactly. we're talking about different price points, and, 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 I, and I do wanna hear about the, the Firefly 2 Plus, because that is, you know, that's a Rolls Royce that's rolling off the assembly line soon. But, but talk about that. I mean, you're addressing different demographics, and, and Yes, the consumer in Colorado is different than the consumer in Illinois. Um, how, how do you view that? Yep, so the, the vape category um, now segments pretty clearly because it's mature enough that you're starting to see these trends. Uh, when any of these... Again, in the green market report, on, <laughs> it's very interesting. Exactly. So it, since it does become at maturity almost as big as Bud, and it's hard to say at maturity, but today, if you looked at last year in California, flour made up about 40% of the market. Pre-rolls were like 8% of that. Um, and so you're seeing, you know, 32% pure flour that you grind up, roll up and smoke or put in a bowl of smoke or cook into food, whatever the case may be, that's flour. Then if you looked at vape, it was around 30%, so almost neck and neck. Um, and so what you're seeing- And growing at a, at a faster rate. Growing quickly. So it might be the dominant sector. 40s, yeah. um, and, and it's segmented a few ways. So you actually see um, premium priced vaporizers, both on the oil side and the hardware side. You see the discount stuff. You see, you know, the value stuff in the middle. You see specialty. Um, and we address all of those markets. So the Firefly um, on the dry herb side, is, it is a Rolls Royce. It's not going to appeal to everybody. But the same people that, you know, like my father-in-law will buy a bottle of wine. He'll tell us about it for an hour. And, uh, and then he'll pour it through a crazy system of God knows what. And uh, there's a bunch of hissing sounds. And then at the bottom, he spins it. And you know, and and he really cares and knows what he's talking about in that in that way. But a lot of people I know buy boxes of wine and pour it into a Dixie cup, and it's just a def different buying pattern. 
Um, so in, in vape, the firefly is definitely catering more to that crowd. I'm guessing this group of people care about the firefly too, and a dynamically heated, you know, with every inhale um, in a titanium shell. I mean, this is this is the kind of stuff that I think people are paying attention. Yeah, there's better mouse trap components to it. The temperature curve does allow you to capture all the cannabinoids along the spectrum because it's not just THC. And as the market evolves and people get more sophisticated, now the you know CBD gets a lot of attention. Um, it's a dominant cannabinoid, sort of next to THC. Totally different effects, um, symbiotic in, in a lot of ways, but there's other cannabinoids as well, and they all decarboxylate at different temperatures, and having a, a, a temperature ramp that allows you to capture them all, as well as the terpenes that provide the flavors, which also have a lot to do with the effect. Um, they volatize at different temperatures. So um, a product like the Firefly 2 Plus helps you really get that full connoisseur experience. We're also extending that brand. Who else is doing that? I mean, it, this, this sounds to me, especially again in the technology behind you know, truly heating uh, the product to the part that, or, or the level that truly brings out um, the optimal, you know, kind of impact. Who, who you know, ha, ha, first of all, how are you testing for that? And, and ultimately, how long did it take for that product to come off the assembly line? Yeah, so the product was developed by a guy who left Apple to start uh, Firefly a handful of years ago. And while he will often bring up the value of the stock options he left behind, uh, leaving Apple 10 years ago, he did create a, a beautiful and, and highly technically um, capable um, product. And you know, not a lot of people have created these convection uh, dryer vapes because of that complexity and because the consumer that uses it has to be a bit, more, a bit more sophisticated. There's a lot more competition in dryer vape on the conduction side where it heats more like an oven for a couple minutes and then, and then you inhale. Um, and Pax does an incredibly good job with that. Um, there's a handful of others. And, and as the dry herb category kind of maxes out, I think you'll see that kind of um, not flatten, but you know, you'll have your market. You know, Rolls Royce isn't selling a million cars a year. Right. Um, and then if you go uh, down at the exact opposite end of the spectrum, more to the distillate side of things, um, we have a product that's growing like gangbusters in California. But a lot of that just has to do with the fact our supply chain is tight and we're able to pull you know, the price lever and, uh, and convenience for people. And a, a company that did that extremely well, better than anybody, was just acquired by Cureleaf uh, last week called Select, you know, a distillate-based product. They just did an amazing sales job, organized their supply chain well, pounded pavement, were incredibly aggressive on pricing, would nearly consign product, and uh, built an awesome market share. A lot of people, when you when you start hearing about the technology behind, uh, you know, the vaporizer, um, I think people also mistakenly believe that this is a place that tobacco companies will, will come in, and that there's some transference between, you know, an e-cigarette uh, and and essentially vaping, especially a dry vaporizer. Um, break that down. Talk about yeah. why why you're not terribly concerned uh, about Juul or anybody else that seems to dominate in the tobacco world right now. Yes, yeah, so it, an important thing you hit on is that the early cannabis vaporizers were just repurposed e-cigarettes. So they all kind of ramped to 600 degrees, which would be optimum for, you know, um, for nicotine, but right. not so much for THC, where even, you know, you'll capture all the cannabinoids by 422 degrees, which is funny, but it's not 420. Not 420. Uh, we would have set the temperature to that. It would have been funny marketing, but we wouldn't have had this high quality of product. <laughs> um, so the purpose-built cannabis vapes, there aren't many of them. Yeah. Um, with big tobacco, you know, they've placed their bets. Uh, Altria made a big investment in Kronos, uh, another Canadian licensed producer from early on that went through a few ownership groups, but now is kind of Altria's bet. Um, Pax has, you know, certain DNA from when... Uh, they were um, Pax Labs before they spun off to be Juul and then Pax Labs. Um, and I think it's just a fundamentally different experience and use case, tobacco versus cannabis. The only similarity is that the dominant way to consume historically has been inhaling, but that's pretty much where it ends. Um, totally different effects, both positive and negative, although right. I shouldn't say there's any positive, but I mean, <laughs> there is scientific arguments for nicotine in a well-rounded, you know. Yeah, but but typically people go out to, to consume an entire cigarette, um, yeah. whereas people may, the, the ideal dynamic, or at least part of what the, the dry vaporizer is solving and solving uh, from a you know, efficiency of use of product, by the way, some very expensive products that you don't want to really burn through too fast, but sometimes people puff and wait and puff 
wait and come back in 20 minutes and you don't smoke a cigarette like that. No, exactly. And it's a, uh, it's more social in, in some ways. Um, it's also more personal in a lot of ways. And yeah, with the firefly mini, not to keep hawking it, but I will, cause uh, that's my job. Uh, it does lend itself to that uh, stop and go, you know, it, it, it heats up in a few seconds. You take your, your puff, you put it down, hasn't destroyed the product cause it hasn't heated it up like an oven. Um, and so, you know, that is, is certainly a use case that's different tobacco to cannabis. So I think what we're seeing broadly speaking is, you know, big alcohol saw cannabis as a threat. We've talked to, you know, everybody you could imagine. And some of them are more uh, candid than others about how they've been talking about cannabis in board meetings for over a decade. They still don't know exactly what their move is. Um, but, you know, like the dust cloud on the horizon is now like a stampede you can see kind of <laughs> coming right at you. So a lot of people are, are trying to figure out where, where they should stand. Um, so you've seen some big alcohol partnerships with cannabis. You've yep. only really seen the one big tobacco partnership. Um, you've seen some pharma stuff. Uh, so if you looked at what cannabis generally could address, whether it's CBD, whether it's THC, whether it's other cannabinoids, um, you're addressing a multi-hundred billion rec market. Um, you're addressing a multi-hundred billion sleep market, a multi-hundred billion uh, pain market. Um, the list goes on. So that just kind of also goes back to like the opportunity size for all of us and how it's not going to be like ride sharing where there's only kind of two apps I want on my phone or social media or search. Um, it is a far more open market to more participants, more opportunities to win. And it's not, you know, this whole cannabis fad isn't going to blow over. They've been using it for thousands of years. It'll be used for thousands of years into the future. And there's kind of this market opportunity that's taken place due to regulatory shifts. But I don't yeah. see that ending either for a long time because at some place in the world, they're still going to be very strict on cannabis for a long time. It's hard to go from beheading people for it to full legalization overnight. You know, we're coming off a much less aggressive position in America, but still it, it hasn't happened overnight. I'm sure my parents and their friends were talking about how cannabis was going to be legal any day now, you know, in the 50s and 60s. And that, you know, didn't play out for a long time. It's funny, it's funny you bring up the rest of the world. Why don't we just go there real quick? Um, it was going to be part of my, uh, my fast fire. By the way, logistics, Deborah. So are we doing Q&A or would we like to? I know we have about uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so I, then I've got to move quickly. Um, uh, let's do a little fast fire. Um, this is where I just want to ask uh, Peter um, or a phrase or something. Peter's going to quickly give me kind of his, his uh, first thing that pops to mind. It doesn't have to be one word. It could be anything. But um, most interesting country in the world outside of North America uh, for cannabis right now. I mean, if Mexico doesn't count, uh, I would say that they are talking Mm -hmm. broad legalization, which is interesting. I think Western Europe is going to play out a lot like the US, but since the EU can kind of move a little more quickly together, it will it will do so. Um, Germany has been interesting um, already for us. Um, so I think Western Europe's hard to pick down. Germany's probably most interesting today. Okay. Um, acreage canopy deal, your thoughts? I think it was great for the sector to see Canadians using their paper, using their position to make bets on the US. I think it's currently facing a little bit of a tussle with the, the fund that came out against the deal. Yep. I think we'll see the confidence level people have in the deal as in terms of how closely the stocks trade to the deal price. Right now, it doesn't seem like the confidence is huge, but I think it gets done and I think that it's gonna be great for everybody. Who's your cannabis idol? Oof. Uh, it's incredibly tough. There's capital markets people that have paved the way massively like Bruce there's people that have you know paved the way in the culture that have taken Virtually. a lot of a lot of risks um, you know even the people that some people like to make fun of like the Tommy Chong's and the Cheech and Chong jokes and the list goes on um, but uh, I think the D'Angelo brothers at Harborside did a sure. huge job for the industry period um, never backing down yep. so I, it would be incredibly hard to pick but the sort of the celebrity the capital markets the, the activist crowd have all done their piece uh, States Act, safe banking, um, time, and any way you want. What, when you hear that, what does that mean to you? I think States Act means liquidity to me. You know, the banks get yeah. comfortable, the exchanges get comfortable, the institutions get comfortable, then there's a ton of liquidity in the space that isn't there today. Um, put your investor hat on, one of those folks, because we know where you sit, but public or private right now, where should people be? Depends what your time horizons are and kind of like what your risk tolerance is. 
Um, you can invest in a publico through you know financings that come out every few months, usually at a discount to the price. And with some of the bigger names, you can hedge it. And so if you're faster money, you obviously have a lot of options in the capital markets. If you have a longer term view, there are some interesting privates you can play as well. Uh, difficult question, uh, but as you said, as a CEO, but single state or multi-state operator, what's the best model? Um, for us, we, we were kind of like the original multi-state in a lot of ways because we've had products in multiple states and depending how you define operations, operations in multiple states. So I think what people usually talk about is they talk about vertically integrated limited license and they say MSO and then there's the competitive states. We personally prefer the competitive states for a lot of reasons, some of which I, I got into. Um, as an investor, though, I think the MSOs represent a good uh, momentum trade because people have kind of muscle memory, and the Canadian trade was so rich when it was limited license, vertically integrated, and then you saw a canopy go from 89 cents to 70 bucks, and, and it has a much more similar business model to, you know, a Cresco. So I think I, I would, I, I'm not going to give you stock ideas, but I think you can't go wrong with MSOs. I agree. I agree. Um, next big strategic in the sector, Who, who's gonna splash in, whether it's a constellation style that may never be done again in terms of the relative size to the industry or to the players itself, but who, 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 who's next, Hazard or Gester? I think it's gonna be one of the non-alcohol uh, CPGs, I'm not sure which, but you know, Buffett was popping off at his conference last week about how it would be a mistake for Coca-Cola to get involved in cannabis, although they actually bought a company that had CBD water like a couple of years ago, so he's obviously not too deep in the weeds of his investments, but I think it'll be someone more like that than it will be another big alcohol company. Coca-Cola, not close, I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, they, so they bought a company, I think it was called Dirty Lemon or something, and they had CBD in the product. They removed the CBD. This was pre-Farm Bill. I'm not sure if they put it back in. They've, they've dabbled. I think, you know, Unilever is kind of... I, I mean, I'm not going to tell tales out of school. I think there's going to be a lot of people doing things in CBD initially. Already there have been announcements. Um, I think it'll be a big CPG player that is non-alcohol. So somewhat related, THC infused beverages as a market segment. Exciting? So THC infused beverages get a ton of attention. I think CBD infused beverages might be a bigger opportunity near term. Um, I can say the the reality of the situation is, and this is someone who has a beverage in market, is that in California, it was like 0.8% of the market last year. It's never more than like, kind of like a percent of any mature state's market. But, you know, it's getting a lot of attention, a huge investment, and there's a bit of a, a, a gap between the reality and, and the possibility. So we have to let data decide what we're going to put resources behind, you know, uh, vape and edibles represent more than half of the entire industry. So that gets half at least of our attention. So, so Constellation isn't in this to suddenly be the corona of THC beverages? I don't think so. I think corona and a lot of these folks are in the lifestyle business, the mood enhancement business. And if someone's on the beach with a corona and a joint, they want a piece of the action in both hands. They're not going to make you put the joint in the corona and shake it around and, and drink it back. That's gross. I mean, it's a decent ashtray when you're done. Probably been done, actually. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so, yeah, someone who's had a too, few too many of both. But, uh, but I think that the big alcohol companies probably see this as like, um, yeah, it doesn't have to be the round peg in the square hole. They'll go where the market goes. The data will guide you, and you can't, you know, force things into existence the market doesn't want. Okay. Hopefully they want it, though, eventually. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll end with this. Um, the future. The future for slang, the future for the industry, uh, it's not a one-word answer, so I'll give you a second. Yeah, I mean, the future at the highest level is that people will be consuming more cannabis in the future than in the past, as long as there isn't some massive population like Malthusian check, but I think cannabis consumption is, is going to continue. Legalization, I expect, will continue also um, for so many reasons, from tax revenue to social justice all the way down. I think in the actual like kind of business environment, the models will shift more to the, the real world economics. You'll see more of the CPG focused guys, the retail focused people, the cultivators, and all of those um, verticals will be compelling to different investors for different reasons. Um, so I think for slang, we're gonna continue running our, our playbook as a, as, a, as a branded product focused company. Um, you'll see us making more acquisitions to develop the portfolio with a regional focus as well as a, a category focus. And I think that 
um, for all of these companies that do a good job, regardless of any sort of market ups and downs, they'll be very successful. You know, cannabis gets compared to tech sometimes. Uh, there's obviously some major differences, but in the sense that they were both big, big waves that took place, you, you know, you saw Amazon start before the dot-com crash and live through it and, you know, be one of the most successful companies in the world. There'll be cannabis companies that fail. There'll be more that fail than fail that succeed. People talk about the green rush. They don't talk about the green flush where most of these companies aren't here. Yep. Um, but the good ones will be, and they'll be bigger and better. And if you're in this industry, you're incredibly lucky to be part of an industry that has sort of this, um, this secular trend of growth. Um, if you're just a cannabis consumer, you're incredibly lucky that you're not going to have your life ruined by a small arrest and conviction for possession. And, uh, and you'll just have a, an availability of more product generally. So I hope we see destigmatization. The market will expand. Great. That's my crystal ball. Future sounds bright. Uh, Peter Miller and Slang Worldwide, thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Peter.